I got so much to say, so I'm just trying to process it all in front of everyone. Hey, give it up for this worship team real quick. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Hey, so I don't know about you, but man, I have big dreams, big goals, big aspirations, and big faith for this year. Amen? I, I know. Um, who was here for Christmas Spectacular? Can I just see a show of hands? How many of you guys, this is your first time really coming to church this year? I just want to see who's lying. First time to church this year? Should be everyone? Okay. First time to church in a long time? Okay, you guys are all a bunch of religious rulers. I see you back there, buddy. Well, welcome. Hey, um, listen, God has been doing some amazing things in this house and through so many people. And a couple weeks ago, we had our Christmas Spectacular, and we had over 2,000 people that showed up to this church um, that heard the message of the gospel. And so first and foremost, I just want to thank everyone that came and that served. Um, that was a, a big sacrifice, a big commitment on uh, behalf of so many people. And so um, as, as your pastor, I just want to humbly say thank you uh, for what you guys did over the last uh, couple weeks. There was 108 salvations uh, during those three days. That's, that's really, that, that's what it's all about. Um, there was numerous testimonies of people just coming up to me or, or Mariah or our leadership team just saying, thank you guys for the excellence. Thank you guys for what you did, man. My neighbors came and my friends came and, and people from work came and, and they were just blessed because of it. And so I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, to God's house, um, just all the servants, all the volunteers. So thank you guys for what you did um, because ultimately we gave, uh, we gave God all the glory all the praise and all the honor. And so I just want to kind of get that out of the way before we step into this new year. And so um, I purposely did not have service last week because I was like, we need a break. And we need a break. And so I have been refreshed and recharged over the last two weeks. And I feel like God has been uh, speaking something to me that I want to deposit into you. And so uh, welcome to 2024. I'm glad that you are here. And uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to just really preach today one quick scripture, and I'll give you some context. Today is really going to be more of an introductory um, sermon. It's going to set us up for the next four or five weeks. And so if you have your Bibles, open them up to 3 John chapter 1. 3 John chapter 1. Uh, we're starting a brand new series today titled Happy, Healthy, and Holy. And so we're going to dive into it. 3 John chapter 1. Starting in the second verse, just really, really quick this morning, it says this. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. That's my prayer for you this morning. That's my prayer for you this year. One more time. I pray that you may enjoy good health. And that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Someone say, good. Someone say, soul. Someone say, soul good. That's my title this morning that I want to preach from, soul good. So good. I love our church because the church loves to talk back sometimes, you know, and every once in a while I'll hear someone in the front row saying, so good. That is so good, Pastor. And so uh, I, I don't know, maybe for 2024, we should change it from so good. And we should just change it to soul good. Soul good. Amen. Amen. Hey, quick question this morning for you. How many of you are believing for 2024 or you would just say, man, I want to be happy this year. I want to be happy. If Good. But if, if you're not raising your hand or clapping, I, I'm praying for you. Um, how many of you this year, you, you said you want to be healthy this year, like you've already, yeah, come on, you've already got the gym membership, you've already started the diet, come on, let's be honest with you, how many of you have already started the diet? I see you, I see you, come on, gym memberships, are you, how are we doing already? I see you, okay, I see you, um, show of hands real quick, how many of you guys are believing uh, God to make you more holier this year? That's me. Come on, you want to be set apart for God. You want to be used by God. You don't want to look like the world, but you want to look like the image of, of God, Amen. And so, um, and that's really the goal of this series. And I, I just want to talk today and really, like I said, introduce what I believe where God's going to take us over the next four or five weeks. Um, he's been de depositing some things in my life that I want to get into your heart. And so um, 
we have to begin today really with this understanding that if we're ever going to see our lives be happier, healthier, and holier, then we first must break past this notion that in order for those things to happen in our lives, we have to understand that they don't come from an external place. If we're going to be happier, healthier, and holier, they don't come from a place that's outside of us. Like, I, I hate to break this to you, but, but the gym's not going to be the place that just necessarily makes you happier. Uh, that, that, that new relationship or that new job or, or, or whatever external factors, that, well, I'm not saying those are bad things, but those are just not going to be the, the thing that make us happier, healthier, and holier. If we're ever going to be those things, then we have to understand that it is going to come from an internal place. It's going to come from an inside out place. And so I guess the question for us this morning, and this is a kind of a deep question to start off 2024, but how many of you believe that God's will for your life is better than your will for your life? Like truly think about it. Like is God's will for my life better? Because my will for my life is really good. Like I want really good things and really nice things and amazing things, but is God's will for my life better than my will for my life. I I would say it is. I would say that God wants to bless you, that God wants to keep you, that God wants to prosper you, that God wants amazing things for you. God's will for your life is good. And and by the way, it's, it's kind of dangerous to pray like, God, your will be done, right? That's, that's a dangerous prayer sometimes. Because God's will sometimes will send us through some fires. God's will will send us through some trials. God's will 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 send us to some places that we never thought, dreamed, or imagined we would be. But if we truly believe that God's will is better for our life than our will for our life, then we have to step into everything that God has for us. Amen? Amen. And see, if if we're going to get God's will in our life, then we have to understand that the only way to get God's will is to obey God's way. Write this down. We get God's will when we obey God's way. Scripture this morning that you're probably familiar with is Matthew 22. This is what Jesus is speaking. He says this, uh, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, What is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. One translation says, and all your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So so what's God's will for my life? That we would love him with everything that we are, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. That we would give him everything. That's what he wants from us. And then we would love our neighbor as we love ourselves. I want to start there this morning. And so Jesus is making this, this statement. And what he's doing is he's assuming that you already love yourself. Right? He's assuming that, that you already take care of yourself. That you already want the best for yourself. And in you can love your neighbor as you love yourself. The question is, is do you actually love yourself? And I think we live in a world today that many people, they don't love themselves. Many people are walking around full of shame and, and full of guilt and full of regret and full of disappointment because of things that they've done or mistakes that they've made. And so Jesus is making this assumption, man, you got to you got to love your neighbor as yourself, but he's making the assumption that you already love yourself. And the weird, the wild and weird culture that we live in today, is sometimes it makes it kind of hard because we live in this comparison culture. I don't know if you've ever been there before. Like you look at someone's life and you're like, man, their life is way better than my life. Their, their family is, you know, way better than my family or their house or their car or their church or whatever it is. And then we start comparing and then we start looking at our life and our situation. And let me just say everything on Instagram is a highlight. Can I just say, like, the videos that I post right before that, like, I'm yelling at my kid, me and Mariah just got in a fight. Like, can I just be real? And then I go on, like, hey, how you doing, God's house? Like, <laughs> like I just want to be fully transparent with you. But I know it's the same for you, so I know I'm in good company. And so we got to learn to love ourselves, right? 
Because if we could love ourselves, then we can love other people. And so Jesus is telling us when your soul is good, when you love yourself, when you're healthy internally, then you'll be able to help the people around you. See, I cannot love my neighbor well. I can't love you well if I first don't have a healthy soul. And I'm never going to get God's will for my life if I don't obey God's way for my life. And God's way for my life is that I will love my neighbor as I love myself, but I'll never learn how to love my neighbor unless I first learn how to love me. It's like, I don't know if you've ever traveled with kids on an airplane before. Um, A couple years ago, we we took our family to Hawaii and it it started out not so good because you have to get on an airplane with kids. And everyone and this has probably been you, if you don't have kids, you definitely understand, is when you see a family walk on an airplane with kids, you are like, please, God, in the name of Jesus, do not let this family sit next to me. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about, right? And so we're walking down the aisle with all of our kids, and I'm just seeing the death stare from everyone, like, do not sit next to us. And we're just like, I'm, I'm sorry, right? We're just passing out, like, peace offerings, like, we're sorry for what's about to take place over the next five hours. But what happens is you, you get on the airplane, and, and, and what happens, right before you take off, the stewardess comes up, and they do all the safety announcements, right? There's make sure you know where the emergency exits are. There's two on, on the, you know, you're right and your left. They're in the front. They're in the back. And then what do they do? They say, if the cabin were to lose pressure, uh, above your head will drop an oxygen mask. Make sure you put on your mask first before you put on your children. And as a parent, this is highly offensive, Right? If you're single, you're by yourself, like you don't really even think about this. It's just a, a, like no big deal. But as a parent, you're like, whoa, because everything on the inside of us says, man, I'm going to take care of my kids first. I'm going to take care of the people around me first. I'm going to make sure that they're taken care of first before I ever do anything for me. That's like the instinct of a mom. That's the instinct of a dad. I'm going to take care of the people around me first before I take care of myself. But they say this every single time you get on the plane because they know that your good intentions are not good enough. They know that if you don't put on your mask first, you're, you're both going to die. <laughs> you're both going to end up short of breath. And so in the context that we're talking about today, we have to make sure that our soul is taken care of first. We're happy, healthy, holy internally first before we can ever take care of anyone else. See, because we all have big dreams and big goals and aspirations, and many of us are running around trying to take care of everyone else First, making sure everyone else is okay, but I'm just going to give you permission this morning to take care of your soul. Moms, let me speak to you here this morning. I know the crazy busyness of life. You have your kids, and then your husband feels like a kid as well, and so it feels like you have extra, but just take care of you first. Dads, I know that you have so much going on that many people don't even know the struggles going on internally, but you got to take care of yourself first before you can ever take care of anything else. Because if you do not take care of your soul, we'll all end up short of breath. We'll all end up not being where God wants us to be. We'll all end up running out of oxygen because we're not breathing correctly. So what's God's will for my life? That I will love him with all of me. And then I will love my neighbor as I love myself. God's will for us is that we would have a happy healthy, and a holy soul. Soul care, write this down. Soul care is not selfishness. It's good stewardship. It's good stewardship. You know, our word for the year, and let me just say this corporately, kind of as a church, um, our our word, kind of what we're leaning into this year, the word is health. Health health. And so our, our word, and I was thinking this, and, and many people were kind of talking to me, and hey, where, where are we going, and what's the vision for God's house 2024, and, and what's the plans, and when are we going to three services, and when are we, do, like, just all this stuff. And I'm like, listen, uh, um, if I'm just being honest with you, church, my goal this year is not to grow. My goal as a church is, is not to, like, expand, my goal is not to get bigger. My goal is that we would be healthy. I just want to be healthy this year. 
and, and, it, and it just so happens that when things are healthy, healthy things grow. It just so happens that when things are healthy, healthy things expand. Healthy things prosper. And so in every single area of this church, in every single ministry, in every relationship, in every department, the goal is not to grow, expand, add any of that. The goal is to be healthy. And the byproduct of health will be growth. The byproduct will be redemption. The byproduct will be purpose. The byproduct will be vision. The byproduct will be us have, having enough energy and breath to do the things that God has for us. And so maybe you have your words for the year. I did a thing on Instagram. I was like, hey, tell me your words for the year. And all you guys were telling me your words. It was amazing. I love it. Awesome. Maybe just add the word health to everything. You want your marriage to be better? It needs to be healthy. And out of that, man, you could bless your kids. You want your finances to be healthy? Yes, out of that, you can bless other people. Like we just want to be healthy. And then out of the health of every area of our life, we will bless God and we will bless those around us. And then we'll be able to take care of our neighbor and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But I think we live in a culture today where we have a lot of silent sufferers. Like everything looks really good on the outside, but on the inside, we're suffering. On the inside, there's struggle. On the inside, there's depression. Can I just free you from that today? Can I just declare over your life today that God wants to get you healthy this year? That God wants to do an internal work in you this year? That I know you still have your responsibilities and those things don't change. But can I just declare over your life that this is going to be the year that you're going to set some time away for yourself? That you're going to have somewhere in your house or, 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 or some, something that you do where you just kind of sit down and take care of you? Can you just, all the wives in here, just look at your husband and say, I'm taking care of me this year? Do what you got to do. <laughs> but I'm taking care of me this year. Like, I just feel this so strongly in my heart that, man, we got to be healthy. I want to be healthy, healthy mentally, healthy spiritually, healthy financially, healthy relationally. And, and the truth is, health looks weird to the world. Like, we were at dinner with a, a couple friends the other night, and uh, we were talking about this show. I don't know if I should say it or not. Um, <laughs> Selling Sunset. You ever seen that show? All right. Um, and we don't. We've watched a couple seasons of it. We didn't. We haven't watched it recently. Um, but just the, like the dynamic of the people within the show is so unhealthy. It's like ridiculous how dysfunctional these people are. But it appears as if it's normal. Like people just watch it all day long and just like that's, that's normal way of living. That's normal way of dealing with problems. That's dealing with, with relationships. That's just, oh, you have a problem with a girl, you just go confront her in the club. <laughs> like you just call her out. On her, and then you just leave, like, and that's what we've become accustomed to just being normal. But can I just tell you that that is not normal? Like God's ways are so much better than our ways. Like there is a way to have healthy friendships, healthy relationships, health in your family, health in your marriage, health in your finances. And so I know that the world will tell you all the ways that they want you to handle all the different areas of your life. But can I just say, we got to get God's way on how to handle all the things in your life. And, and to be honest with you, it may be hard for some of us to hear. Because we've become so accustomed to doing things our way for so long. But God is saying, hey, listen, if you want my ways, you have to obey my word. And after you obey my word, <laughs> you will have my will. And so maybe this is the year of, of some redefining. Maybe this is the year of some, um, some healing Maybe this is the year of some restoration. Maybe this is the year where you finally say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do it this year. Like, I, I'm going to get every department of my life, I'm going to get it right. Because it's real easy to start, and I'm, I'm not even on my notes right now, to be honest with you. <laughs> but it's really easy to, to start something. Like, what's the date, the 7th? How many of you have already have not read your Bible all year? Like you said, like December 31st, you're like, yeah, this is the year I'm reading my Bible. Right? It's like seven days in. I've already skipped like six days. 
It happens. It happens. How many of you have said, I'm going to the gym five days a week this year? You've been twice. <laughs> right? I'm going to pray every night, me and my wife. Oh, you haven't done it at all. Right? This, and it's so easy to start resolutions, but it's so much harder to maintain what God wants you to do. And so I'm just believing that, that God is going to bring some health to your situation. And it's out of the healthiness of just your, your whole entire being that you're going to be able to maintain everything that God has for you. Because anyone could be healthy for a day, a week, or even a month. But God wants your whole entire life to be healthy. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let me get back to my notes because I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so good. So good. So good. I, I want to make this just very, very practical for us today. And I'm not like, I, I, I'm really, I was talking to Mariah last night. She was like, because we don't really discuss like what we're going to talk about too much, like the details. And she's like, you're going to get them fired up tomorrow. We're going to go. She was just like speaking. Over, I was like, I'm just kind of going to talk tomorrow, to be honest with you. And she's like, no, you got to get them going. You got to yell. You got to. And I love doing that. I love preaching. Like, I love, come on, step out on. Like, I, I love doing that. But every once in a while, man, I just got to, I got to pastor some people. I, I just got to like. I really want your life to change. I I really just believe that if you could apply what the word of God says to your life and just really trust God, like these songs that we sing, I don't want this to be just Christian karaoke. I don't want this place to be just a, a Christian country club. Like I really want this place to be holy ground. I really want this place to be when you step in here and, and, and I don't care. I don't care. Like if it, if it doesn't, blow up and we reach thousands and thousands of people. I just want the people that God has put in my hands to steward, to shepherd. I want you to be healthy. I I want, like, I'm going to be accountable for your life. I'm going to be accountable for what I teach you. I'm going to be accountable for, 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 for the way that, that you live. That's on me. I'll be, I'll be judged even more. And and so as I step into to two and a half, almost three years of, of being a senior pastor. I shouldn't be in the position that I am right now, but God has trusted me with this position. So I have a responsibility to take it very, very seriously. And so, and so I don't get up here and take this lightly. I want to help you. I, I, wanna, I, I want your life to, to reflect the kingdom of God. Yes. I don't want this to be just another year where you just, same struggles, same, same depression, same anxiety. And so we're doing everything that we can as a church to help you be happy, healthy, and holy. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about this word called spiritual formation. Spiritual formation. Maybe if, you, if you've grown up in church, you've heard this before. If you, if you haven't, it's all good. Spiritual formation. The truth is this. Every one of us has been formed into something. And we're either being formed by design or by default, right? We're either getting richer or poor. We're either getting uh, uh, weaker or stronger. We're, we're either getting better or we're getting worse. We're all being formed into something. We're all a byproduct of spiritual formation. Let me define it for you real quick. It is the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and for the sake of others. Okay, remember, it's God's will for my life that we would love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind and all of our strength and and to love my neighbor as myself. But I cannot love my neighbor if I don't love me. So who am I becoming? What am I being shaped into? Because the only thing that's more important than who you are today is who you're becoming tomorrow. Jesus's words, he says this, Mark chapter eight, verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? Yet profit their soul. Yet forfeit their soul, excuse me. And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Why is it that your soul is of such immense value? Because many times we hear this verse and we think that Jesus is just talking about heaven and hell. But, but the full context of what Jesus is talking about is not just our afterlife. He's, he's actually talking about our here and now. And I think that the church needs to do a a better job of not only getting people into heaven, but really getting people to live happy, healthy, and holy lives here right now. 
we're not just called to survive this life. We're called to thrive in this life. We're not, we're not just called just to struggle. No, no, we're called to have abundance. We're, we're called to have the Zoe life, the, the abundant life. That's the life that God has for us. And so Jesus says, what does it profit a man? If you, if you gain the whole world, if you get all the external pleasures, if you get all the rewards, but in the process of getting everything your little heart desires, you lose your soul. Because when you lose your soul, you're being transformed not into the image of good, but of evil. Not of righteousness, but unrighteousness. Not of peace, mercy, grace, and truth, but of discord and dysfunction. Your, your soul is priceless. Why? Because your soul is the thing that's guiding your life. It's like an invisible rudder, just, just steering your life. It's your soul. That everything you do is coming out of your soul. And I want to help you understand your soul. Write this down. You cannot steward what you don't understand. And so I want to help you understand your soul. Someone say soul good. Soul. Now we can apply this statement to, to many areas of our lives. Like you cannot steward what you do not understand, right? We could, we could apply this to money. Maybe the reason that many of us struggle with money is because we don't fully understand money. Therefore, you cannot steward your money. Maybe some of us in here have been up and down with our diet and our health and our weight and all that other kind of stuff. It's because we don't fully understand it. Therefore, we cannot steward it. Maybe the reason you're having any problems Ends with your men with your wives is because you do not understand her. <laughs> Therefore, you cannot steward her. <laughs> or maybe it's the other way around. I'm not sure. But but you cannot steward what you do not understand. E even like your kids. Some some of us have this image uh, of our kids when they were four, but now they're now they're 14, and we're still trying to manage them the same way. But you need to understand that they are not the same kid anymore. And so the reason you're having a problem stewarding them is because you don't understand them. And so I want to help you put some language behind your soul. What is our soul? So we can better steward our soul. Like if we start to pass around the microphone right now and said, hey, find your soul. How I many you know, we'd, we'd come back with some crazy answers. It, it'd be all over the place, right? Um, it's because we haven't taken time to, to learn about it. And so therefore we cannot articulate what it actually is. Happy, healthy, holy. Okay, I love, I love the words. They sound good. They're great. But how do, I, how do I get a happy, healthy, and holy soul? Well, first, we need to define it, right? There's a book called The Renovation of the Heart, and it's by this author named Dallas Willard. And he gives a diagram of the soul. And I really want to use his outline of the soul today as a guide. Um, and it's really going to help us over the next four weeks. Um, and my goal is to help you, like I said, better understand your soul so you can better steward you. Amen? And so here's, uh, I don't think we have this on here. If you put up the first one, um, the, the, really the first area of our soul is our heart. Our heart, our heart. Okay. So the heart is really the core of who you are. It's, it's everything that comes out of your life is, is coming out of your heart, right? Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, right? For it is the wellspring of your life. Everything that comes out of your life is coming out of your heart. It's the, it's the core of who you are. What happens when we follow Jesus? Our heart begins to change. Our heart begins to transform. Our heart begins to desire more and more of the things of God. God said in the book of Ezekiel, I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give to you a heart of flesh. Right? God is inviting us to exchange our hardened hearts, our sinful hearts, for ones that's filled with compassion, with, with grace, with love. See, the goal of spiritual formation, right? We're, we're, we're all trying to be formed spiritually. The goal of spiritual formation is not behavior modification. The goal is heart transformation. M my goal is not to get you to stop doing bad things. <laughs> no, the goal is to change your heart. Okay, this is why uh, we, were, we were youth pastors for six years. And... Um, in the youth pastor world, a lot of it has to do with behavior modification. You're trying to get all these teenagers to stop drinking, smoking, cussing. It's like, dude, that's what teenagers do. 
you know, we were all there once. And so if you just bash them over the head and tell them to stop doing everything that they're not supposed to do, they just want to do it all the more. Come on, you, you know how you were when you were 16, 15, 12, 18, and like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the, so the goal is not just to change their behavior. The goal is to change their heart. And see, as adults, we do the same thing. The, the goal of our church, the way I preach, is not to get you to stop doing bad things. My goal is to help transform your heart, transform the core of who you are. See, we're all born with a sinful heart. Every parent with a toddler knows this. Like, it don't matter how cute they are, how precious they are, how sweet they are. Like my little baby girl, Brazil, it's like, oh, my gosh, you're amazing. My favorite child, right? <laughs> But she's a sinner. <laughs> like, she's just, her, her first word, promise you, dad, dad. Her second word, no. Her third word, mine. <laughs> right? Because she, she, her heart is just bent towards sin. It's just natural. We're just, we're just born sinners. It, it, it's just who we are. And, and so we have to work on our heart. The other words that are associated with our heart is our will in our spirit, it's from, it's from my heart that I have a will to do something, right? What is our will? It's our, it's our ability to create. It's what sets us apart from, from everything else, from the animals, right? It's our will. It's that we can take nothing and make it into something. We got a, we got a willpower. You ever heard people say, like, he's not smart, but he's got a heart? They say that about me a lot, right? Like, <laughs> it, it's a determination that comes from within. The, your spirit is the invisible qualities that, that make you you. Every one of us has a spirit. The question is, has your spirit been renovated and surrendered to Jesus? And so the first part of our soul is our, is our heart, the, the, the core of who we are. The second part is our mind, is our mind. Remember, we're trying to get our soul good. So I'm just helping us really today. Very, very introductory stuff that we're going to talk about and break this down over the next four weeks. So, so just bear with me. But then the next part of our soul is our mind, it's our it's our thinking. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And so all the change that you want in your life first begins in your mind, right? If you want to change in 2024, then you're going you're to have to go ahead first. If you want to change your living, it starts with changing your thinking. And so if you don't like your situation right now, if you don't like your, your circumstance right now, if you don't like the way things are going right now, it starts first with changing your mind about that. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then what? You will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay. So we started by saying, how many of us believe that God's will for us is better than our will for us? We all said, yes. Amen. I believe it. Well, if we're going to test God's will for us, then it starts with transforming our thinking, right? The other two words that are associated with your mind is your thoughts and your feelings, okay? What am I thinking about? Because your thoughts turn into your feelings and your feelings turn into your actions. So if I'm constantly thinking negative thoughts, if I'm constantly thinking fearful thoughts, if I'm constantly thinking doubtful thoughts, then those thoughts will turn into the way I feel and those feelings will turn into the way I live, okay? You ever met someone, don't look at them right now, but they always got a problem? Like there's always an issue? Something bad is always happening to them? Well, their mind is unhealthy. The way they think is tarnished. And so their thoughts are turning into their feelings, and their feelings are producing the way they're living. Write this down. If you want to change the way you're feeling, change the way you're thinking. Okay, if you want to change the way you're feeling, then change the way you're thinking. The third part of our, our soul, and this one might surprise some of you guys, but it's, it's, it's your body. It's your body. First Corinthians 6, 19 says this. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. See, our body, this, this physical body is, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And our physical well-being affects all the other aspects of our life. And so if we can take care of our bodies physically, 
then our emotional and mental and spiritual health will increase as well. See, the world has this misconception, and really it's a deception, I believe, in their mind that whatever your body desires, your body should get. That the world would say whatever pleasure, anything that feels good, you should do, right? But as Christians, we need to have a a very high view of the body. We don't give our body whatever it wants. This is the part where I said it might hurt a little bit. Like we don't sleep with whoever we want. We don't put into this body whatever we want. Why? We discipline our body. We make our flesh submit to a regenerated heart, right? What did the apostle Paul say? He said, I discipline my body like an athlete, right? Training it to do what it should. What should it do? It should run the race that God set before you. So we have to have a healthy body. See, I love my kids, but it's out of my love for them that I discipline them, right? You got to love your body. And out of your love for your body, you discipline it. Like if I gave my kids candy and sugar and snacks, three meals a day, seven days a week, you'd call me a bad parent, right? You say, that's bad parenting. That's not good. But see, we live in a world that says, give your body whatever it wants, all day, every day, whenever you want, whatever feels good. And we just say, you're grown, do what you want. It's the same concept. But see, you have to understand that every time you do that, your soul is deteriorating. Your soul is falling apart. See, as Christians, we do not worship this body. We worship God with our body. Okay? Uh, Other words that are associated with your body is your appetite. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) Uh-oh. And your habits. Okay? So, So once we get the right habits in our life, we get the right disciplines in our life, then we'll learn to love God with our whole soul which even includes our body. And lastly, um, the last part of our soul for this context is our relationships. Okay, worship team, you can come join me. Our relationships. See, we are our social context. We act, we we behave, we think, we talk, we, 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 we live like the people around us, right? You cannot separate your soul from the people around you. It's a part of who you are. And so here's the thing. We all come from somewhere, and we all come from someone, right? We, we all come from different environments and backgrounds and, and situations. But see, you get to decide the health of your relationships. No one else. You, you get to allow all the, the people in your life to either negatively affect your soul or positively affect your soul. You, your social construct, people around you, man, that, that matters. the life that you're living, the the things that you're struggling with, those things didn't just happen overnight. A part of it was was your social context, the people around you. See, you're, you're not just an addict because you just decided to be an addict. No, no, no. There was people around you that, that planted seeds, that spoke things. Maybe it was your dad or maybe it was your grandpa. There were certain things that were passed down, right? You don't just deal with anxiety or depression because you enjoy it, right? A lot of it has to do with kind of the the people around you and what's happening in the environment and your situation. And so what does that mean? That means we got to go deeper this year. That we got to bring some health to those situations and we have to address them. Amen? And so how do we change our heart? How do we we get this body to submit? How do I transform my mind? How do I get the right people around me? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in this series. One of the very first things, and just very, very practical again this morning, is, is start reading your Bible. <laughs> and I was like, what? I'm telling you, there's, there's just something about opening up the Word of God every morning. I mean, you don't like, have to be in the morning. Just do it when you can. <laughs> just get into the Word of God and just read a chapter a day. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send the whole church a text with a link to the Bible plan that I'm doing. But just get into the Word of God, even if you don't understand it. <laughs> Just write down what you don't understand. Start there. Get into a connect group. I'm telling you, like, the people around you, it matters. And and so we want to lose the world's ways, and we want to gain our soul. Amen? And so all of these different aspects that we're talking about makes up our soul. So our soul is not just an abstract thing anymore. 
It's something tangible that we can understand, that we can put language to it. And so all of these things, our, our mind, our heart, our, our body, our relationships, these, these things are all intertwined and, and work together. And so if we're gonna be happy, healthier, and holier this year, then we gotta start somewhere. We gotta start like, okay, how do I manage these things? How, how, do, I, how do I correct some things? How do, I, how do I grow? Well, first we need to address and diagnose what part of our soul is sick, okay? I read this verse this week and it just ministered to me and I wanna share it with you. This is David, uh, who's by the way, just so in touch with the soul. Uh, just notice all the, all the different layers that he speaks to. Psalm 16 verse seven says this, I will praise I will praise the Lord who counsels me, right? I will, I will praise the Lord. Think of Matthew 22. I will love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, it speaks to the context of relationship. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. See, when we talk about our soul and we would say soul good, it's a, it's a statement, but we can easily add a question mark to it and say, is your soul good? Like, I, I know you got, you know, your, your, your resolutions this year, and I know you got your vision board, and I know you, I know you got your diets, but, but is your soul good? How do I get a good soul? Number one, you gotta renew your heart. Number two, your, your mind has to be transformed. Number three, your body has to be retrained. <laughs> and number four, your relationships have to be submitted. And when my soul is good, the results, the results are a good heart, a good mind, a good body, good relationships, soul good. And my prayer for our church, my prayer for you, my prayer for your family, as we step into 2024, right? With all the projects, with all the things that we're gonna do this year, with all the, the different ministries and everything going on and with all your resolutions and with, with all the goals and the dreams, my, my prayer for you this year is that we would do everything that God wants us to do from a place of health. And so my prayer is this, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. Dear friends, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word today. God, thank you for um, what you're doing and what you're going to do in this house. God, thank you for every single person in here today who's made a commitment that said, God, I'm gonna get my relationship with you stronger. God, I'm gonna be more disciplined this year. God, I'm gonna be more obedient this year. God, I'm gonna be more uh, sacrificial this year. God, I, I wanna live my life in a way that honors you, that blesses you. God, I wanna be happy, healthy, holy. I want my soul to be good. God, I want your will to be done in my life. God, I wanna love you with every single part of me, my heart, my soul, my, my mind, my strength, my, my body, my relationships. I wanna love you with all of me, God. And I wanna love my neighbor as I love myself. And so God, I'm declaring this year that we're gonna work on us, God, so we can love everyone around us even better. God, thank you for the word this year. God, we wanna be happy, we wanna be healthy, and we wanna be holy. God, thank you for what you're gonna do in us and through us. God, we give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, you're the king of every king and the Lord of every Lord. Come on, stand up to your feet. In Jesus' mighty name.